Research and Distinguished Fellow USAID. He was advisor, Defense Expenditure, 10th Finance Commission in India, member of the first National Security Advisory Board, and member of the group that drafted India's nuclear doctrine. Lieutenant General PJS Pannu, PVSM, AVSM, VSM retired, is a former deputy chief Indian integrated defense staff operations responsible for coordinating military operations of the three services. He was responsible for raising the defense space and cyber agencies as well as the special forces division. He commanded 14 corps in Ladakh in 2016 to 2017, and an infantry division on the LSE Mac Mohan line in Arunachal Pradesh in 2013 to 2014. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my mind uh, goes back to a very good introduction by the uh, uh, our uh, MC, and uh, what I heard was elections in China. So we are talking about Xi Jinping's election to become the president in the third term. So I was really wondering um, what are these elections, how these elections are held, or is it self-elevation? Or is it completely going and capturing the power and becoming the head of China, where China and Xi Jinping have become a byword? Either it is China or Xi Jinping is China or China Xi Jinping. Literally, he has gone and completely established himself as the sole power and a decision maker where everybody is looking at China as the central power, not the power that can decide, but I think power of concern. And the last couple of months to say that there was a spectacle in the SEO in Samarkand where from the Indian perspective, you look at how India should look at Xi Jinping's rise in his third term. Completely expected, but now it got confirmed. But there was, I think there were a lot of undercurrents when he met our Prime Minister Modi in Samarkand, that there was no dialogue. There was a language which was unspoken. There was a behavior which sent signals that there is a problem either within China about his own position, or there is a problem between the two leaders with a degree of discomfort in which he might like to understand things differently after he becomes uh, a leader, uh, renominates himself as a leader in the third term. So from SEO, we came down to the 20th Party Congress, in which actually it became a reality that Xi Jinping now was a leader, completely unprecedented for the third term. And in 2018, certain amendments, which he had said that no two terms, but I think also, it was known that he is going to be the president of China for life. Now, at 69, he has made all the arrangements, and I suppose uh, there is a general understanding that Xi Jinping is going to be absolute power till as long as he is relevant to his own life, or as long he can control for the reasons that we will see how whether he or is, is in control, or for certain reasons there would be certain undercurrents of different factions coming up. And those undercurrents have been actually from overtly have been pushed down and have become subterranean. Uh, that could be one, one issue which Xi Jinping would, I think, in a manner of perception, would want to underplay. But I think largely there would be a concern that inside China what happens and outside what he wants to project as a leader. I think those are the things that we have to look at. The subject of obviously is that Xi Jinping's third term, what does it mean for India? When the whole world is looking at Xi Jinping in China, what does Xi Jinping's third term mean to the world? What does Xi Jinping's third term mean to the United States, uh, who as now superpower are under threat because Xi Jinping and uh, earlier, the design that the China has built over is to become the sole superpower crossing China, uh, crossing uh, United States uh, by uh, 2050. But I think there is a, question mark coming up whether he will be able to uh, be able to economy wise or otherwise stature wise he will be able to cross uh, uh, and or replace United States to become a sole superpower I think that that has become a very big question and I think that is one big concern that both United States and Xi Jinping are going to start looking at how the future is going to be panning out 
how does she jumping be seen by the world obviously as a threat because over a period of time china saw the entire world as opportunities and in last couple of years china started seeing the whole world as threat i think there is a very big shift on china seeing the whole world as opportunities to uh, it being seen seeing whole world being a threat because now china sees uh, uh, the whole world very differently from the new prism and therefore makes preparations for internal security which obviously are are uh, brushed under the carpet but i think it being a very opaque society uh, you do not know always what is happening in china within china as far as the undercurrents and um, and and the action that the pla or uh, the party takes to curb those and bring uh, the entire i mean uh, in a country where almost just below 1 billion are members of the communist party uh, what do you expect uh, why everybody is not a member does it matter or all members are going to be loyal uh, to xi jinping is another question mark because what happened in 20th uh, congress was a spectacle of hu juntao being taken out uh, what is that whole world is looking at it whether uh, it gives us some indication of the how the future is going to unfold or it is going to It really confirmed that Xi Jinping is the ultimate power, and he has nothing else to fear. As far as India is concerned, India looks at China from many prisms. The world is also looking at India as a relevant power. The United States increasingly making uh, uh, more uh, uh, suggestions of alignment. Uh, Quad has shaped up. i think this is the first time that quad did an exercise malabar uh, in an area and area of concern for china and also where all three countries of quad actually put the militaries together and to do an exercise i think that became a very big concern for china because largely we are talking about china uh, where quad would be a military or a not a very uh, you know understood to be as a military alliance but well india underplays it uh india also keeps looking at strategic uh, autonomy when it talks about the quad or how the global alignment will happen but certainly when you talk about india looking directly at china obviously um there are problems on the line of actual control over a period of time from 62 onwards i think there has been a certain way india has been dealing with china initially of course we were shocked by our external policies foreign policies and diplomacy i think state craft was in the default setting at that time that uh, there was a need for us to overtly befriend china because we could not uh, face china at that time i think we wanted to make peace so hindi chini bhai bhai became a very big uh, uh, slogan to talk about our foreign policy and diplomacy but i think it also put india uh, in a state where we did not make any preparation thinking that hindi chini bhai bhai is actually a reality on ground and therefore since we did not make any preparations 62 then unfolded in a manner that uh, which it did uh, and uh, the force levels of india of course the way we were reshaping our military was actually demilitarizing uh, our already formed units which we had which uh, had good experience uh, when we became independent uh, we also fought first battle in 1947 48 uh, but 62 was a entirely different story that neither did we have any preparation understanding or any force levels worth uh, uh, its name uh, when we had to face a sudden uh, attack by uh, so called brother uh, china when you look at the future next month we are going to have g20 coming up so between seo to 20th party congress to to g20 meeting i think something would show up at that time when the leaders are again going to meet so if the language from samarkand to g20 is going to undergo a change i think that is what india also needs to read but i think more than anything anything else i think along with the reading itself i think india needs to prepare we have been looking at china over a period of time the boundaries other than all the other countries that they are neighbors i mean i read india and bhutan as one as far as boundary issues concerned so it china has settled its boundaries with all other countries but not with india and bhutan being part of it as i said 
Second thing is, what is concern of China as far as the LSE is concerned? I think it is not only the LSE per se. It is certain signals which we send across is that all is not well and we are looking at certain areas. And all, we talk about the excise chain because when we mark the <coughs> international border, we certainly look at that. Whereas China, to oppose it, starts claiming 90,000 square kilometers of Arunachal Pradesh and starts looking at Ladakh territory from a two-front um, perspective, if you look at militarily, but politically, when you look at the CPEC corridor and the economy that is coming there and the collusion between the two states, I think the entire two-front dynamics in Ladakh completely undergo a change. And I think that is also a real threat because this is how the landscape, the policies, strategies, and the, I think, political dimensions will unfold in that area. Uh, whether we are prepared, we are going to fight a war or not, I think that is what we will, we will talk about. But there are certain very serious concerns that Xi Jinping has an absolute, uh, absolute power. And once you have absolute power, it will do what an absolute power does. Take decisions, which can be brash. There's nobody to question. It might also have a, a undercover or underpinning, sorry, underpinnings of internal disturbances being quoted differently. And they might become militarily more aggressive. Uh, Xi Jinping has been going around and inspecting their training facilities and making uh, certain uh, very clear direction, making giving very clear directions to the military that uh, uh, they should be prepared for uh, for a war. Uh, Taiwan and uh, Ladakh, or our northern borders, are of course main areas of focus as far as the military is concerned. The three Western Theater commanders, X3 uh, uh, Theater commanders from the Western uh, WTC have been promoted. They are in a very uh, uh, influential position in the CMC now. Um, two vice chairmen, of course, both have had experience on in India. And of course, uh, the vice chairman, General He, has also had uh, uh, experience in the Eastern Theater. So he is an expert, so to say, on handling India and uh, Taiwan. I suppose he's the one who's a loyalist. He's the one who's going to, I think, dictate how militarily uh, China shapes up uh, in the future. Um, all the loyalists there in the standing committee in the Politburo and all the loyalists, uh, military loyalists in the CMC who are largely army and not Navy and Air Force. So when you say that the army generals are the ones who are going to be guiding Xi Jinping on the policies, so I suppose it is more about the land war. It is more about their experiences uh, as far as India is concerned. So I think that is what sets the entire landscape of discussion that the CMC is going to be looking at the prism of the experiences that the CMC uh, through the Western Theater commanders have had the exposure on uh, the line of actual control. And uh, we would do what we would do in response, but I suppose this is how India looks at uh, the future. So I suppose we will continue to uh, yeah. uh, talk about this, but I, I think this is, this is, these are my initial comments. Uh, just by way of context, I think uh, the one thing we need to note and keep in mind is the utter contempt China has always had for India. Always had for India. The utter contempt that uh, is evidenced in history uh, from 1930s and 1920s onwards where when notables like Rabindranath Tagore and Dr. S. Radhakrishnan and others visited China, they were actually booed by the audience who called them representatives of a slave nation. They have utter contempt for you, for us. And this is the baseline that unless we admit it to ourselves because it shows us in bad light, Unless we see how the Chinese see us, we'll not be able to deal with them as they need to be dealt with. When someone deals with you and shows you extreme contempt, uh, then at least it tells you that there is no median line. There is no compromise. And the 20th Party Congress has just come out for the first time, talked about new military guidance for the first time, any party Congress has come up with what they call new military guidance. 
Among the guidelines is, of course, the usual things that we are going to emphasize cyber war, we're going to uh, emphasize uh, directed energy, weapons, and so on and so forth, space, etc. cetera. Uh, but more importantly, I think in 2015, the, uh, the Chinese government uh, articulated something called the MOOTW doctrine, the military operations other than war doctrine, which I think has not been paid attention to by us in India, neither by the military nor the government. What does the doctrine say? There's no notion of compromise here. It talks about border incidents being opportunities for demonstration of force. And I'm using it exactly, their terms. Border incidents as opportunities for demonstration of force. To what end, you might ask? And they make it clear as well. They say that it is to assert our sovereignty and to protect our territory and rights, again, rights in the, they're talking about territorial rights. When you put all these things together, what you essentially have is a recipe for, in a sense, whether we like it or not, there is no closure to it. It's virtually interminable war. <coughs> now, we can choose to try and de-escalate and talk about having kind, some kind of confrontation at lower levels. But the Chinese, again, and she in particular, has made quite clear that he's quite happy to pursue a two-track policy with a connivance, I'm afraid, of the Indian government and military. Why do I say connivance? Well, this is what the Chinese policy is. You can by way of protecting your sovereignty on the border and so on, and, and they still you know, believe very much that the Aksai Chin and that entire area is part of the <coughs> Chinese realm and so on and so forth. But, and we have already lost a thousand odd square kilometers on the uh, Tepsang Plains. But, and this is part of what they think is theirs. Now, the question is, what will they do to pursue this? This becomes an episodic kind of logic to it. They're not going to always fight with you all the time. As was perhaps hinted by previous speakers here, it's enough that they impose the cost of permanent readiness for the Indian forces on the border. There's a cost there. Building up infrastructure, that's a cost. Not that we shouldn't have done it, we should have done it much before we did. But that's a cost now imposed on India. Which is what I've been saying for 30 years, that we have, it's not the resources that have been lagging as far as India is concerned and the Indian military is concerned, it is that we have misused the resources by focusing on China, uh, on Pakistan, which is really a nuisance, not a threat. And if we don't even understand the difference between nuisance and threat, we have a problem. It's ours. And we have now become victims of the problems we have created for ourselves. The basic thing about the Xi Jinping, I talked about the two-track policy. What is the basic element? You keep the Indian military unsettled. They've got the measure of you. They've got the measure of you. And basically the operations, I mean, uh, I, I don't know whether General Pannu would want to go into it. <laughs> Maybe it's classified, I don't know. But they have been probing cyber. They have been, we are having, experiencing all kinds of interventions right now. They have the kind of capacity to get into your decision loops right now. They've done it with the Americans, for God's sake. So they can't not do it with us. 
We are at a very infant stage of developing our cyber warfare. That's the best that can be said about our capability. Um, and therefore, we'll be easy targets for them. India has always been seen as easy pickings by the Chinese. I'm sorry to say, we, we, our military thinks a lot about itself. We think about a lot of our military. But our military has major weaknesses in terms of actual capabilities. We can fight the kind of what uh, General GFC Fuller called gentlemanly wars with Pakistan. Or, and what I think the former director of military operations in the 62 war, uh, General D.K. Pilot called, uh, the India-Pakistan conflicts I mean, he called them communal riots with tanks. It's actually a wonderfully apt description. But these are, and by the way, the riot uh, template is what I actually analyzed. It's published in the round table in London uh, in 1996. But actually all India-Pakistan wars fit the template of riots in terms of duration, in terms of intensity, in terms of constrained time and space, right? But vis-a-vis -vis China, we have no template for war other than reacting to what do the Chinese do, which is a bad thing to be on. If every time you are prepared only to react because you're in the passive defensive mode all the time, then you're going to get it in the neck because the initiator always has the advantage as the first mover at any given time. Secondly, on the two-track policy, why is it that the Indian government and the Indian state continues to allow the kind of access to the Chinese companies and trade that is so imbalanced now that of the 97-odd 97, 97 billion dollars about two months back of bilateral trade, already 97 billion dollars, about 70 billion is Chinese imports into India. I mean, or Chinese exports to India. In other words, India imports, and that's the balance of payments deficit that we have. How come we are not closing down that, you know, closing the door to the Chinese trade and commerce? Not that it'll hurt them greatly, but it'll send them great signals that look, either you're going to have peace or you're going to have war. You cannot have both. But China now thinks that it can have both, that can actually have, you know, carry on, militarily discomforting you, and make money out of you by having access to your market. So let's at least be clear about the threat we are dealing with and how to deal with the threat. I don't think anyone in the government of India seems to be very clear about how to deal with it. Um, I think we have uh, only limited time available for this discussion. Just uh, maybe two minutes for, and then we can go to the floor yes, if you wish. Yes. So, uh, really looking at the three areas of contest which are emerging in the world. Uh, first has always been territorial, and uh, we know what the LSE is, it is undefined, uh, it is loosely understood, and therefore the perceptional differences are the ones which are being handled by the military largely. Uh, over 20 boundary talks have literally not taken us anywhere. And the political leadership, unfortunately, is not talking. And it's very clear that is the state today. So who's talking actually the military commanders on ground when you have a military problem and you gave some square kilometers lost or not lost because I think it is yet to be decided. Uh, it is not yet permanent state on the LSE that they are in Depsang. And I suppose we are looking at uh, the status quo ante, uh, April 2020. Uh, so I suppose it is only the two military commanders and of course there is a representation comes from the MEA who are deliberating on how to uh, de-escalate, maybe demilitarize at some point. But I think demilitarization may not happen very quickly because both sides have militarized. And this is a new uh, phenomena where LSE is not LSE, is not even become the LC. But I think it is somewhere between the two that there are certain areas where there is no eyeball to eye eyeball, but currently there are two pockets where the proximity of troops can be in a manner spoken in a manner that they are eyeball to eyeball. One is in Depsang, 
and secondly is in the area of uh, CNN uh, them chalk. So I suppose uh, these are the things to be sorted out, uh, which once, if done favorably uh, from the Indian perspective, we would achieve uh, our uh, objective of having the same status as we had in April 2020. But speaking beyond that, what are going to be the ambitions of the Chinese as also the Indian military are something which we can continue to debate and we will never be able to settle unless the tall leaders, you see what happens is when the leaders are powerful, they can also make accommodations because they're less worried about the constituency back home. Uh, they're less worried about the sentiments of the people at home because sentiments of the people are completely then controlled by the leaders on top. So certain concessions can also be made. So one way is that there is an ability now of the strong leadership to take great decisions to buy peace. And today we are sitting in a situation where the leaders decide to buy peace, they will be able to buy peace, it's possible. But if the leaders decide to go and fight a war, and why the Chinese may like to do that, fight a war, is they cannot fight a war in Taiwan because actually they are landing up in the American fold. And America might like to even prove a point to the Chinese and to the world that they haven't arrived yet. So that becomes a contest of a very different nature. The, the uh, operations are going to be highly complex there. Those amphibious operations with uh, Air Force and both the Navy and the Air Force have actually zero experience. They've never fought. They have built a very powerful Navy. If you start counting the number of uh, platforms and ships, uh, even more than the United States. But has that Navy been operationalized, whether they have gone over globe and done all that the American um, uh, naval power has achieved? Uh, the answer is no. So therefore, I think Taiwan is something that they would not want to take a risk. And as far as the CMC is concerned, with the army being dominant there, they're more, interest, uh, more interested and have more experience on the Indian borders. They might like to show some aggression here, but largely the defense industrial complex of the of Chinese have not been tested yet. They have been showing around the J-20. They know that the air power and the naval power have come up. Earlier they had more uh, army, but now the naval and the air power has also got stabilized. And I think India should not underestimate that both uh, the additional dimensions of uh, the space and the cyber, I think have a great edge. So with Chinese having acquired a new dimension of Navy, air, missile, as also the cyber and the space are the ones which are uh, an area that we need to not only compete, but I think we need to be very, very seriously concerned about because we may not have a situation that you start a ground operation and we are defensive and they are offensive. That may not happen. We being offensive is another question mark and, and let's put that aside. But I think largely they will have an upper hand where technology is concerned because technology is going to be the main driver as far as the warfare is concerned. I think that is, that is something that uh, should concern us. Whether we go to war with China or not, I suppose if China wants to make a war, for them, they might take India as a more, more of a testing ground to test their equipment, the military industrial complex, and to prove to the whole world that this is where we can show aggression because to qualify to be a superpower, and if they have to qualify to be a superpower to reckon with, they have to demonstrate their strength. While the internal weaknesses of demography, economy, their climate change, and uh, they had, uh, you know, uh, a lot of other issues uh, within China and, of course, um, deep uh, undercurrents uh, which uh, some opposition might uh, make, make a big challenge for uh, them. But I suppose India needs to be prepared that they should not use Indian territories to set an example to the world that the Chinese military has actually arrived. And I think India needs to prepare for that. Can I just add one uh, minute's worth? Um, First of all, I think those of us who are trying to think that there's safety and security in relying on America, uh, I think you should disabuse yourself of any notion. There is no cavalry coming to save the Indians, um, as different from the cowboy films that we saw in our childhood. Um, the secondly, you are always going to be inferior in the foreseeable future, conventional military-wise. There's nothing you can do, no matter what amount of 
resources you invest now, because the monies you invest now in trying to upgrade your conventional military in an ordinate way would be 30 to 25 to 30 years. So that's the timeline. So we don't have the time. And therefore, what happens if there is, uh, you know, uh, something tomorrow or day after? Well, what I've been advocating since the last book, uh, about five years old now, I've been saying, let's do what conventionally weaker states, nuclear weapon states have done when confronting comprehensively more powerful states, who are, of course, nuclear armed as well. China, in this case, India versus China. But what the states have successfully done over the last 30 years, Pakistan versus India, North Korea versus America, and now Ukraine versus the NATO assisted, um, you know, NATO assisted Ukraine versus Russia. Is you threaten nuclear first use? We have to forward deploy our nuclear assets on a first use. You might think this a radical notion. And what happens is we, you know, most of us are about 10 years behind what actually needs to be done. We cannot match up with China. And therefore, we have to go ballistic in some sense by forward deploying our you know, tactical nuclears, get our Prahar Nibhais nuclearized, get them our missile forces up front, so that that's a tripwire you set up with something that I've educated from the time when I was in the NSAB, which is atomic demolition munitions to be placed in the passes that we are likely to have the PLA ingress through. What happens with that? It's a very clean solution, actually. Why? Because what is the one thing that really deters talk of nuclear weapon use? Radioactivity, is it not? If you bring down the mountain size on ingressing group armies, the Chinese group armies, what that does is it earth and dirt are actually the best absorbers of gamma ray. Gamma rays, which is what radioactivity is about. It will entomb the radioactivity. So there's no venting of radioactivity. It's a very clean kill. It also is the first tier tripwire. You put it in, publicly talk about nuclear first use. Put in the tripwire, because there's nothing you can do conventionally to deter or impede the PLA from achieving its objectives in the next 30 years. Let's at least be honest about it and do what all the other states that I've just mentioned done with great success against much more powerful foes. So I, I suppose uh, yes, sir. we can go ahead and uh, wait for questions to be asked. Yes, please. So myself, uh, Vabhav, I'm from MKU Limited. We are producers of night vision and soldier systems. Uh, I've been, you know, uh, since the morning, I've been seeing that a lot of the talk has been around China and India. And uh, being an industry participant, uh, I would like to share my concern here, which is a very sorry state of affairs, and other industry people would agree. Uh, when we go to service headquarters and ask them point blank question, whether would you allow Chinese material to be part of your hardwares? They say we will follow the government policy. As on date today, the government policy is very clear that you can import raw materials Absolutely. and components from your neighboring countries. Now, if this is the state of affairs where service headquarters being the uh, users of this equipment and wares, and there have been issues in uh, northern sector and some other places where you know the wares have been found that there have been bugs or back uh, channel uh, leakages of your information. I fail to understand as the industry participant why service headquarters not clear about their requirements and why they are sitting idle on these kinds of decisions. And we were made to uh, believe that you know, uh, there were certain procurements which became uh, you know, the uh, piece for media where Chinese materials came in. 
and uh, there were remarks uh, from certain government sectors, uh, so government people that, uh, you know, we have to follow the WTO regime. But uh, when I discussed it with other people, I was made to believe that defense in nowhere in the world has to follow the WTO regime because it's a, you know, a strategic uh, sector. So I, I would request uh, both the panelists to please, you know, dwell upon this because this is really killing the industry. And if we really want to have a sustainable and reliable industry, and we want uh, the wares to be made in India, the materials to be made in India, then we need to take a stand somewhere that, you know, such things will not creep in. And this is uh, when we are speaking to our foreign partners from Europe and US, they say that till the time you will have such policies in place, even if I think to set up a local manufacturing in India, how will we compete with these kind of, uh, you know, aggressive pricing from the Chinese side? So I, I would uh, request both panelists to please, you know, share their views. I, uh, I just want, I don't want to actually steal the thunder uh, from the next discussion. General Khandar is talking about the role of private industry and Atam Nirbharta, so in the next panel, I suppose. But since you've asked a question, a very quick opportunity I'll take is that there are three fields that one has to look at. The power, materials, and electronics. You spoke about materials, and materials which are uh, in the supply chain, trustworthy, are the ones which are okay. But again, it's a big debate, what is trustworthy, and how do you ascertain whether they're trustworthy or not. As far as the power, is concerned, I suppose when you go to war and you have to fight a digital war, I think all our platforms are going to start consuming power. And all the UAVs or anything which is aerial or even special are the ones who are going to rely hugely on power. And if your power is going to fail or power is not going to be good enough, you will have lesser ranges and you have lesser reliability and all your payloads will not function to the desired levels. Uh, that is what industry should look at, that how to, how to build power for these uh, platforms. And the third thing is electronics. On one side, of course, is semiconductors, and a lot is being said about semiconductors. But in the design and development, I suppose, miniaturization and the speed of processing. Uh, semiconductor, of course, is largely is being spoken about. But there are many other fields in the electronics which I think the private industry can look at. But... Largely what you're talking about is that it is important for the military to lead rather than industry to A, suggest what they could do and military to pick and choose what they want or they don't want. I suppose uh, in one of the uh, articles that I have written, I'm talking about military 4.5. Now, why it is military 4.5? Because today industry has almost reached standards of uh, 4.0 that is the information age, and all the platforms are being based on what has been achieved by Industry 4.0. May not be completely, but the point is there. But I think the military needs to start thinking beyond 4.0. And if military doesn't think about it, I think we are going to surely lose. It's going to like buying a bad insurance policy that you will invest huge amount of money, but at the end of it, you will lose the uh, contest somewhere. Uh, I suppose this is what I can say, but I uh, would say that your next session would be more uh, likely to address your, your question squarely. Just, uh, just a point. I've also been advocating, unsuccessfully obviously, that um, the Defence Minister, and this is before this government came in as well, that right away and instantly there should be a stop genuinely to all imports. Much of what uh, Dr. Koshik talked about is really hogwash. But, you know, uh, the point being that the reliance and dependency on components and so on is so large that you can hardly claim anything as indigenous. And therefore, the point is, how do you stop it? There's no point in the conventional military saying, oh, well, we have to fight a war, therefore we have to get something and therefore we have to import something. I'm sorry, it doesn't work that way. For 70 years, you did not reverse engineer anything. You imported and kept in for, in importing things. You developed vested interests in, these, in this sort of traffic. And then 80 years later, you wake up and, oh, we are Atma, Atma not Nirbhar. Right? It doesn't work. And therefore, what's the solution? The solution is going cold turkey. 
How is that? Well, for instance, we've just seen, if you leave it to the damn private sector, they can create miracles. We have, a private sector company has just created a launch, a rocket launch system, a satellite launch system by itself, outside of the ISRO. I know of various companies which have developed components for 6G, forget 5G, we are into photonic communications, and yet the government of India doesn't invest. And when we get the whole system 30 years later from abroad, we'll say, ah, well, you know, we have to do catch up. The point I think is, if that import door is shut to everything instantly, no import means <coughs> no import of anything, is when you'll in, you know, you create inducements and incentives for the private sector, which is far better. The money spent on the Diardo is such a waste of public taxpayers' money. For 60 years, we have wasted an awful lot of our efforts. Had we gone straight to the private sector from the very beginning, and by the way, we had it during the Second World War. Most of, we were, you know, we were called the Eastern Arsenal. India, because India supplied both the Eastern Southeast Asian theater and the Western Desert theater entirely from India, including aircraft. We produced the Lancaster bombers, we HAL, and that was then under Walchand. Private sector, leave it to the goddamn private sector to do the work, put in a profit incentive, motive in it. Profit is not bad. This is our remnants of the socialist thinking that's killing us. I'm sorry to say that unless we take hard decisions and decisions that end the, the way we are conducting our business for so long, we'll not really go ahead. It'll take us another 70 years, God knows if at all. Because they'll, you'll have more vested interest in importing things, more people making money out of everything in every place. And then we'll review the fact that we are where we were in 1947, when actually our defense industry was far ahead than we are now in some respects. It's an irony, isn't it? Somewhere down the line, we really, the ultimate thing is that we really are not truthful with ourselves ever. You know, we, we still like the advertisements about ourselves. The question is, are we convinced about it? We seem to be, because we seem to be repeating the same mistakes. Uh, just a word of caution that globally, as far as the high-tech equipment is concerned, there is hardly any country which manufactures everything by itself. You have to go for collaborations. And I think we have to make it convenient to know from where to get what. Make it easy to start. Make it more worthy where the technology comes in. And as a uh, professor said that, if they want to make money, obviously, they, they will not come for charity. They will make money. So don't, don't look at it uh, from uh, you know bad eye. Allow them to make money. Allow the private industry to make money. Because over a period of time, they will make good uh, for, for us to substitute our defense expenditure out of the profits that the industry will make uh, from the defense industrial complex. The industrial corridors are coming up. But I really wonder how much do they know what to make uh, and with what to make. As far as the legacy equipment is concerned, of course, you know, old tanks, old aircraft, I think that is where we have stayed. Unfortunately, INSAS was produced here, but which was a NATO concept. Now we have started importing 7.62, which is American. But why is it that our legacy manufacturing of rifles cannot be world class? But we, we could not produce uh, something, but we have imported some 72,000 once and 72,000 another, two transfers of uh, 7.62 weapons, which we very badly need because the infantry needs to be modernized. But I think we need to very quickly rig up. And uh, I think we had that 203, um, uh, you know, uh, AKA series, which is going to be manufactured, uh, it's already under manufacture, which is a great step. But also that was a foreign collaboration. So I suppose we need to collaborate very quickly, make sure that the niche technology flows in uh, and let profit not be seen uh, from a negative point of, point of view. Thank you, Professor Bharat Karnat and Lieutenant General P. J. S. Pannu. An absolutely amazing discussion it was.